Yeah, let the big dog hunt. Hello again, everybody. Time now for another episode of Callous Remarks with Joe Stasak and my good buddy, Steve Callis. How you doing today, Steven? All good, Joe. Great to be with you as always. You too, my friend. Well, uh, good time of year. The low is over. Playoffs are coming. NHL, NBA, NBA season wrap. Sixers number one seed in the East. Lakers in a little precarious situation. We heard uh, LeBron complain about the playing situation. I don't blame him. Didn't hear him last year, but that's fine. <laughs> what do you think of these playing with this this playing nonsense? Uh, I think that's exactly what it is, nonsense. I mean, come on. I know you got to get extra games. I know you need more money. But the excitement over the 7, 8, and 9, 10 games, uh, to me, it's kind of like, except for the Lakers because of their injuries, it's kind of like uh, that first meaningless whatever in the NCAA tournament where the 16 plays the 16 to get blown out by the one. Um, but look, they apparently need the money. But I think it's disgusting when and i'm just going to read you these these records in the east now the seven seed celtics so it's seven through ten they're trying to get to the seven and eight seed the celtics are at 500 okay that's the disgrace but the wizards are 34 and 38 the paces are 34 and 38 and the hornets are 33 and 39 and in 2021 if you woke somebody up who died like 30 40 50 60 years ago They'd be laughing because they go, what, these guys made the playoffs? They have a chance to win the championship? Right. So I think it's a disgrace. It's so funny to see everybody on TV. And I guess if you work for ESPN, you have to be excited. Everyone's excited. They can't wait. I heard one guy say today, well, I know some people don't like it, but I think it's fantastic. And it's just, again, you can't cheapen the regular season anymore, or every time I think you can't cheapen it anymore, they find a way to cheapen it. Last year it was just for the final spot, you'll recall. This year yeah. it's for the two final spots. And I'll say it again, with four teams at 500 or under in the East, it's just a disgrace. But that's where we are. And frankly, isn't it interesting, because the Lakers, which ESPN says under that BPI index or whatever it is, says they have an 8% chance to win the championship. And I think since those two guys look healthy now, AD and LeBron, they have a much better chance than 8%. I think so, too. And I think that'll show. Um, who else could come out in the West? You liked the Clippers before the season? I did, too. Are we still on board with the LA Clippers? Uh, I, I kind of am on board. The only thing I'm hanging on to is Ibaka missed like six weeks, and he came back for the last game. And he's a big addition. Rondo, you know they got. Uh, to me, it still all depends about Paul George. Is he going to be Paul George? I'm not so good in the playoffs, Paul George. Or is uh -huh. he going to be Paul George? What I thought anyway at the time last year was one of the at least 15 and maybe even 10 best players in the league. If you get the second Paul George, I think they have a chance. Um, but they're also coming from the four seed. You know, they didn't even hold on to the three seed. So that's going to be a problem as well. But I'll still stick with the Clippers. And I like the Sixers in the East now. I know you like them more than I did, but I, the Nets played at set, the, the big three played eight games together. And as great as they that. are, the notion that they're going to, even the last game, Harden didn't play. You thought he might get in there to have a little, I don't know, chemistry with the other. Now, they're all great players, as we know, but the Nets aren't great on defense. That hurts you in the playoffs. And I personally think that eight games with the big three, they were six and two. Um, but eight games with the big three, I don't think is going to be enough. So I got Clippers, Sixers in the final with the Clippers winning it all. How about you? All right, that's good. Uh, I'm going to go with the Clippers still since I mentioned the Clippers. I don't know if Brooklyn, like you said, see, here's the thing with Brooklyn, two of the three guys might be enough if they're healthy. I'm not sure. I mean, those three are elite. I mean, elite top five guys in the league. And you're right, Harden's uh, still banged up. I, I, I have a hard time buying into the Sixers until I see it. I need to see it in the playoffs. <laughs> I need to see Embiid not have a chest cold or, you know, a pinky tear or something. And Ben Simmons come to play every night. So uh, uh, I, I'm going to say Brooklyn and the, the Clippers in the finals. And believe it or not, I'm going to go with Brooklyn. I am. I'm, I'm going off the, off the charts and, and – Maybe uh, 
putting too much on all three being healthy at some point. But if not, I'll I still like I'll still go with there too. So and I don't know if you saw I don't know if you saw the interview with Kyrie Irving and oh boy. and you know he's a little out there as you know personal yeah. days the world is flat you know the whole bit but um, he apparently recently became a Muslim um, which I was not aware of and he gave a really impassioned speech actually where he said I have to tell you right now basketball isn't the most important thing to me look at Palestine look at the world my people are being you know persecuted and discriminated against. It was very interesting. And he said, I might not be able to answer your questions because it's not that it's not the most important thing to me right now. Uh -oh. Which is the basketball fans kind of scares me right before the playoffs start. It especially you. when you need those three guys to be in lockstep. Um, but you know, when his head's in the game, you're right. He's one of the top, top players. I think the best guy going to the basket in the whole NBA. Yeah, and I'm not comparing him to like uh, the Greek freak because he's a different kind of going to the basket. But in terms of a guard going to the basket and scoring over big guys, he's one of the best to ever do it, not just the best now. So I think a lot depends on the whole mental state of the group. Durant is tough and a champion. Harden's tough and wants to be a champion. Kyrie's been a champion. But again, you just don't know where his head's going to be. And on the one hand, I commend him for his views. On the other hand, I sure. almost think he should have kept him to himself. Right. Exactly. He's he that that certainly would instill. If I was a Brooklyn fan, I'd be a little worried now. If a guy says it's not the most important thing, just let yeah. me think. You think it's the most important thing? But anyway, um, Russell Westbrook, you know, piling up the, the triple doubles. I know it kind of irks you a little bit because of. Uh, one of your boys in the past might not get his fair shake. Talk to me about uh, what you got going on. Well, I just think, again, the rules then, the rules now. You can go to YouTube and find video. I think it was the first year uh, that Westbrook got a triple-double, and they showed that the OKC big men, uh, Stephen Adams, I forget the other one, on foul shots would box out so Russell Westbrook could come in from the three position near the foul line and get the rebounds. And he led the league. No guard had ever been in the top 10 in a, I don't know how long they've been keeping this stat, but no guard has ever been in the top 10 in uncontested rebounds, which are usually off the foul shots, right? Yet somehow that year, he led the league in uncontested rebounds, the first guard ever to crack the top 10. There's video of that where you can see exactly what people are talking about. The only other thing I'd point out, because I don't think Westbrook is anywhere near Oscar as a player. He's not a very good shooter. And Oscar is one of the greatest shooters of ever. I told you about true shooting percentage uh, off air a few days ago. I can't even tell you what true shooting percentage is, but the only two guys who played in the 60s into the 70s who are in the top 250 are Oscar and Jerry West. And Oscar is third all time. I can't even tell you who the top two are, but you know, it might be Jordan. I don't, I don't really know. But my point is, this guy was one of the greatest shooters ever on top of everything else. And oh, by the way, nobody knew what, what a triple double was um, when Oscar right. played. I always go back to Mantle and Mays to when Canseco in baseball went 40, 40, 40 homers and 40 steals. Both of them said, if I knew that was a thing, I would have done it. And, and Mays right. even said, I only, stole, I only stole bases to help the team. His point being, of course, he never stole bases, bases right. for independent, uh, individual stats. So sure. look, give, give Harden a lot of credit. He's incredible. And he's averaged a triple double now for four years out of the last five. I've told you that Oscar averaged a triple-double for the first five years of his career and was a tenth of a point off on a rebound to be the top the first six years averaging a triple-double. But he only did it in a season all three once. So take what you want from that. But again, uh, Scott Brooks made a big mistake when he said that Westbrook just passed Oscar as the number two point guard of all time with Magic being number one. Not yeah. only is Oscar the number one point guard of all time, you know, in my view, he's the number one player of all time. And to Oscar's credit, he gave Westbrook all the credit in the world. So good for him. He really took the high road. But the other thing I wanted to say is the assist record 50, 60 years ago, I was told, I couldn't find it in the rule book, but I was told when Oscar passed to a guy in a three-on-one fast break and the guy dribbled once and scored no assist. You had to catch it and score. You had to catch it and shoot and score from the outside. So think how many more assists Oscar would have today. He would average sure. like four more assists per game. So yeah. 
Um, maybe that's just a complaint or about from an Oscar fan, but I think people should really look into that. And again, you can definitely see the video of Westbrook coming in from near the foul line to get multiple rebounds because his big men were boxing out big guys. And that's to me, yeah. look, it's a triple double. I give him all the credit in the world, but don't, don't even think about telling me he's better than Oscar or even near Oscar as a basketball player. A little bit manufactured. I hear you, brother. Let's talk a little NHL. A uh, couple Florida teams at the top of their division are close behind the Carolina Panthers, the former Stanley Cup champ, the current Stanley Cup champions, the Tampa Bay Lightning, the Florida Panthers. Uh, Florida kind of came out of nowhere. Carolina kind of had a surge. And then there's Tampa, who is, are the Cup champs. What are the chances they repeat? And uh, if not, who do you like? Well, I think there are chances. Because Kucherov hadn't played all season, and here's how good he is. His first game of the year was his first playoff game against Florida, and he scores two goals and gets an assist. Stamkos hasn't played since April 8th. And according to Barry Melrose, who you trust, he was a little – he wasn't quite ready, but Kucherov was. So if Stamkos becomes Stamkos – remember he had the biggest goal in the playoffs last year? He only played yeah. two shifts. He scored that goal – and lifted the team tremendously. If he becomes Stamkos, I think they can win the whole thing. Um, and then they had Braden Point in that game who scored two goals, including the game winner against Florida. And Florida is the favorite, you know, well, at least they're the higher seed. Right. Braden Point had like 33 points in the playoffs last year. He was incredible. So you have a season championship team, Vasilevsky, the goalie you know is very good and has already won a cup. So do I think they can win? Yeah. But I'm going to go with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, since 1967, they haven't won. Uh, I don't know if a Canadian team has won since the early 90s. I know the Canadians won in 1993. I know nobody in that North Division, which is mainly Canada, of course, has won since 1993. But I'm going to go with the Maple Leafs. You know, Austin Matthews is probably the best goal scorer in the league, him and Ovi. Um, so I give them a shot. Tavares came from the Islanders, and now he's established in Toronto where he grew up. Uh, so I think they do have a chance. So I'm going to pick the Maple Leafs. But I look out now, especially if Stamkos gets his legs under him. Again, he hasn't played in five or six weeks, but you got to give Kucherov credit. He hasn't played. I think he had offseason. I don't know if it was hip surgery. He had surgery offseason and never played the whole year. But he looked awful good yesterday. Uh, and again, between him and Stamkos, and then you throw in Braden Point, they got a big chance to win it all, I think. But I'll go with the Maple Leafs. How about you? I actually, um, sarcastically, I think I said the other day, uh, I'll go with the Caps because I just usually take the Capitals every year. And uh, they don't have um, my man, uh, the, the head coach is now with the Islanders. Harry Trotz, uh, yeah. Harry Trotz was a huge mistake. I actually like Tampa uh, for a lot of reasons that you said. And I'm looking at the other team. You know, Vegas is still hanging around the top. Every year since they've been in the league, they've been a very good team. I like Tampa. They've won a cup. They know how to get there. You mentioned Stamkos and Kucherov's now healthy. Uh, Vasilevsky. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna hitch my horse to the Tampa Bay Lightning, believe it or not. Another Florida team. You know, we haven't won a cup around in these parts since 75. And Florida, team, Florida teams are now winning cups. California teams. So that's who I'm going with, brother. Yeah, I'll give you a couple. I'll give you a couple more quickly. Minnesota with Cam Talbot in goal. Yeah. And he's been playing well. 42 saves overtime shutout against Vegas. One nothing. Uh, he was incredible. And Flurry, our guy from the Penguins, Mark Andre yeah. Flurry, uh, he's now started in goal in the playoffs in 15 consecutive seasons, the longest streak in the history of the National Hockey League which is pretty wow. incredible. Wow. Uh, I don't think goalies necessarily played 15 years with the with, uh, on playoff teams way back when. You think of the Canadians, they must have made the playoffs, you know, 20 or 30 years in a row in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I don't know. But he's the first guy to do it for 15 seasons, so give him credit. And the other one, the Islanders, being the Islanders, somehow found a way um, – to beat the Penguins in overtime, the Penguins are the number one seed. And again, that's a Barry Trotz coach team, the Islanders. You got to beware of them. But sure. they beat the Penguins game one in um, overtime. And Palmieri, who they got from the Devils, uh, scored two goals in that um, 
in that game, including the game winner. And if you get a chance to watch one goal in the playoffs so far, look at Palmieri's game winning goal, which was the goalie had his left shoulder pinned against the, you know, left side. And he raised up like this. And then the crossbar to the goal post, there was, I tried to measure it the best I can on TV. There was like three inches between his face mask and the post. And there was like, I'm going to say six or seven inches between his shoulder and the top of the crossbar. And somehow, again, you have to see it to believe it, Paul Murray put it right there mm. to win the game in overtime. And those kind of game one OT wins, as you know, can totally shift the series. Now the Penguins have Crosby scored a goal. They're still the Penguins. But I give the Islanders a chance for what would be seed-wise an upset because of Barry Trotz. Big swing games, those overtime games, man. I can't get enough overtime, hockey, NHL playoffs. Uh, and then now talk a little bit about this. We previewed it the other day, you and I, but uh, Medina Spirit allowed to race to the Preakness. Bob Baffert not allowed to be at the Kentucky Derby anymore. But uh, he, he came up clean, but came in third. Um, do you make anything of that? What, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Well, that, well, that's the problem. As you know, the Derby's a mile and an eighth. The Preakness is shorter. This never made sense to me, but the Preakness is shorter a mile and three sixteenths. Um, and so for him to be dead game in the Kentucky Derby, and he was, horses coming at him, head and head, neck and neck, nose to nose, and he held them all off in the Derby at a mile and a quarter, yet in the Preakness, and, and tested positive, and again, they have what's called a split sample. It's going to take a week or two to get the second sample. If that sample comes back positive, even though Baffert has lawyers and excuses, it was just something uh, that a vet gave us some kind of cream to put on his legs. Um, I don't know if that sounds like Barry Bonds, you know, the cream. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but under the trainer responsibility rule, which in most uh, states is absolute, you're the trainer, 24-7, you guarantee that horse won't have any drugs in the right. system. Baffert was like, I have no idea how it happened. Uh, you shouldn't do this to the horse, which is, you know, a bunch of baloney. Uh, Cause the horse doesn't know he won the Derby, uh, but Baffert does. And that's his seventh to set the all time record. So I think if that second test comes back positive, he's going to be DQ'd from the Derby, but the average better is now going to say, hold it. He won at a mile and a quarter right. that game. And at a shorter distance, he got run over really, frankly, at the top of the stretch, he was beaten. So there's a big differential there. Now I'll say to you, as you know, I trained and drove horses, uh, harness horses for many years. They're not machines. You know the story. They're not cars. You can't just step on the gas. You can't take them out all the time. And thoroughbreds today, racing two weeks apart, that virtually never happens with good horses, except in the three-year-old Triple Crown. Nobody does this anymore. We've talked for years, you know, it should be the first Saturday in May for the Derby, the first Saturday in June for the Preakness, the first Saturday in July for the Belmont. And then you have the big one at Saratoga, which they call the fourth leg of the Triple Crown. The Travers in August, that's how they should do it. But because of, I guess, this is the way we've done it for 100 years or however long it's been, this is how we're going to keep doing it. Uh, I think it's bad for the horses. I think it's bad for the sport. But Baffert, who did not show up to the Preakness, he didn't want it to be an issue, and his horse gets run over. So there's going to be the people who are just simply going to stay. Look, he was awesome in the Derby at a longer distance. He got run over in the Preakness by two horses, and there must be something to that drug thing. I'm not saying there is or isn't, but I will say I think if that second sample comes back from the Derby positive, I think he's going to be DQ'd from the Derby Again, way after the fact. It has happened once before. Afterwards, you know, maximum security got DQ two years ago, right there, right after the race. But this is a drug-related um, incident, so by definition, you can't do it till a week or two later. And think if you bet, you know, the second horse yeah. finish of the Derby, uh, it, it's a black mark for the sport, no matter what happens. And again, the, the, the Baffert knockers, because he's had five positives in the last year, the Baffert knockers are going to say, look, he had the stuff and he won the Derby. He didn't have the stuff. He got run over in the Preakness. I don't think it's as simple as all that, 
but that's what the general public's view is going to be. And that's why horse racing in general often has black marks. And this is one of them, no matter what happens. You're going to miss those cutaways of that Bobby Kremens lookalike in the, uh, right. With the mint shoulders. <laughs> I always think of Bobby Kremens when I see him. You're right. Great, great stuff, my man. Uh, well, obviously we can be in a few days. We'll do another podcast on Friday or Saturday morning. You can follow Steve on his Facebook forum page at uh, Speaking of Sports with Steve Callis. You can also check out WestchesterCountyPost.com on YouTube. You can check out this podcast on YouTube as well. And on my Facebook page, you can follow me at Joe Stazak975. Great just stuff again, Stephen. Great seeing you, man. I'll see you in a couple of days. Always a pleasure, Joe. Great to be with you. You too, pal. Have a great week, folks. Talk to you soon.